Friends, I call you to worship this morning. Let's behold the wondrous mystery of the gospel of Jesus together.
Son of God. Oh, Son of God, rescue us, rescue My name is Evan Story, and I'm one of the pastors at City Church in Cleveland Heights. We are so glad that you are joining us for our digital service from wherever you are. Welcome. Right now, we're going to pray for our global partners. Uh, Pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for uh, your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you that we have peace with you through Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask Father, that your gospel would be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Lord, we thank you for Jeremy and Tiffany in Washington, D.C. Lord, we ask that uh, from the fullness of your grace, Lord, that they would uh, know that they have received so much grace from you, Lord. And we ask that uh, as they are doing the work of ministry in the Lincoln Heights neighborhood, Lord, that your grace would be manifest in their midst, Lord, that many would come to know Jesus that you would encourage and strengthen them. Lord, we pray the same for Pete Stewart and Lindsay Stewart, Pete and Cara Bell, and our own Faith Whitaker in Glasgow, Scotland. Lord, we ask that from your fullness that they would receive grace upon grace, that you would encourage them, that you would help them, uh, especially, Lord, with the limits that this pandemic has placed on their ministry. Lord, we ask that they would know the sweetness of the gospel Uh, in the midst of trial. And Father, we also ask the same for Muhammad and Isabel in West Africa. Lord, uh, from your fullness, may they receive grace upon grace, Lord. Uh, Lord, we ask that you'd protect them, that anyone who would seek them harm, that uh, they would be foiled and that uh, oppression would cease in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that you'd get much glory uh, for yourself through the work of our partners. Lord, that you'd continue to help us build relationships with gospel preaching churches in this city and that jesus would be proclaimed uh, through our lives uh, in the midst of each other through the power of your holy spirit we ask these things in jesus name amen again welcome i'm so glad that you're here Uh, we are going to turn to the gospel of matthew chapter 5 verse 9 which reads blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of god This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are continuing in our series, Your Kingdom Come, examining what these words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 6 and the Lord's Prayer mean for our daily lives. We have broadened our focus to the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus prayed this prayer, to help us in our understanding. And today we are returning to the Beatitudes uh, in the passage that we just read, Matthew 5, 9, we see the climax of Jesus' description of the character and culture of his kingdom. Why does Jesus emphasize peacemaking as his climax? Well, to answer that question, you should know that Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 9 would have surprised and even troubled many of Jesus' original listeners. Why? Well, Jesus was subverting their expectations of who they expected him to be. Jesus was speaking to a people colonized by the Roman Empire, a rather brutal government. As a messianic figure, Jesus' call to peace would have sounded like surrender to foreign oppression. There was no call for political overthrow. Did Jesus not see how these people were suffering? They thought Jesus would bring them peace. Well, in our day, there is no shortage for the need for peace. 
We all suffer varying effects of this global pandemic, relationally, emotionally, many physically. Ethnic harmony still rings with dissonance. Our political conversations feel deafening and tempt many to bigotry. As you listen to Jesus' words, perhaps you sense Jesus is subverting your suffering. My prayer is that we would all see that this is actually great news of compassion. Jesus is calling all who listen to his words in Matthew 5, 9 to see that peacemaking starts with a change in identity while moving into action. So our first point is peacemaking grows from identity. Well, again, the Beatitudes are Jesus' description of the character and culture of his kingdom. To be blessed is to have joy, the joy of right relationship with God and each other. The Beatitudes can be falsely read like a righteousness math problem. The Matthew 5, 9 religious approach might sound something like this. My peacemaking earns my ability to be called a son of God. Well, on the other hand, you have the more spiritual sounding approach, which would sound something like this. Naturally, we are all God's children. Therefore, peace is the pursuit of us all pursuing our individual truths. Well, Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, and specifically here in Matthew 5, 9, shows that he rejects both of these views. The sequence of the Beatitudes demonstrate this. To be poor in spirit is to acknowledge we will never earn righteousness before God through our own effort because we are diseased with sin. This causes us to mourn the suffering our sin produces individually and corporately and leads to God's comfort. This comfort produces meekness, a person who has peace because they're not consumed with self, they know their need for grace, and admit gentleness and kindness. As we see how we fail in being meek, we hunger and thirst for righteousness that only God can give. This overflows into our dependency on God's mercy to give us righteousness and leads us to show mercy to others. The overflow of our dependency on God's righteousness is the hope of a pure heart and the promise of seeing God. Those whose hope is in seeing God because of his granting us his righteousness will then understand the call to peacemaking as a need for holistic transformation. When you think about something being transformed, uh, an image that comes to my mind is marble. Uh, if you go to the Cleveland Art Museum, you can see some beautiful sculptures. Well, one thing that is incredible about sculpting is that it's a massive uh, piece of stone that someone uh, you know, can spend probably up to years attempting to make something uh, recognizable out of essentially nothing. Well, here, Jesus' arrangements of the Beatitudes is like a master sculptor chiseling away at a piece of marble. Each beatitude is like a hammer stroke, revealing a little bit more of the image the artist intends to capture. In this seventh beatitude, we begin to see the image Jesus wants us to see. The kingdom of God is full of peacemakers who live out of their identity as sons of God. Well, what does it mean to be a son of God? The apostle Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. We become sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, the man who is fully God and fully man. We come to him poor in spirit and trust in his perfect life as our righteousness. We mourn our sin and trust in his death as the atonement for our sin. We have faith in Jesus being raised from the dead giving us the sure hope that Jesus Christ has defeated sin and death. And with our faith in those promises, we now share in the radical promise of being made God's sons. Why sons? Does that language offend you? I found it surprising. Well, some translations deal with this tension by saying children of God. The original translation uses the word sons and that was no mistake by Jesus in Matthew 5, 9, or Paul in Galatians 3, 26. 
Jesus and Paul are not commending patriarchy. Rather, they are condemning it. In the time Jesus and later Paul was speaking, the oldest son was the legal heir to an inheritance. Daughters had no legal inheritance. Jesus and Paul are saying to have faith in Christ is to receive the full rights of God's oldest son. Who is God's firstborn son? Jesus Christ. All who repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus receive the full riches Jesus receives from God the Father. This is the identity of all Christians, sons of God. From the wealth of their inheritance in Christ as sons of God, Christians are called to peacemaking as their mission. Our second and final point will be peacemaking as our mission. One theologian I read this week said this, peace for the nations flows from peace in the hearts of individuals. Peacemakers are not power brokers, but people lovers. As I read that quote and I consider Jesus' words about peacemaking, and I look at the circumstances that are happening around me and in my own life, I have to say it, um, the idea of being a power broker rather than a people lover is much more tempting. Uh, when I have power, I feel like I'm in control. And 2020 definitely has been a year where I think most of us feel very out of control. And let's face it, loving people is hard. And some people, uh, they often seem like they're not worth loving. And to ask us to make peace with them, uh, that feels rather insulting and undermines the legitimate hurt they have and perhaps will continue to cause us. Being able to wield power over our circumstances sounds like what we could all use more of. But please consider this. Jesus has come to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Jesus undermines the very fabric of society. He will subdue oppressive hearts before he will bring unending justice. God will bring circumstances into your life, into my life, that disturb our peace. And Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 9 subverts our suffering the same way it did for his first audience who heard him speak. God will make us feel powerless, and I can tell you part of the reason why. You will never know love if you cling to power. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, whose own suffering was subverted so that all who trust in him could experience lasting peace and be able to call God Father. By this I mean, if anyone had the right to cry injustice, it was Jesus. And if anyone had the power to stand up to the injustice and free himself, certainly it was Jesus. And yet, he chose not to, because his enduring temporary injustice allowed lasting justice to reign and his people to receive peace. These peaceful individuals now also make peace. As one theologian said, since sons inherit their father's riches as well as their father's characteristics. We see a display of the father's characteristics among his people in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came 
and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The context of this passage is that moral outsiders, Gentiles, and the moral insiders, the Jews, only have hope of being reconciled through Jesus' death on the cross. This passage describes the uniting peace Jesus brings to his people. The people of God are those who have a united faith in his promises. And what is that promise? Hostility between God and his people has ceased. Through the cross of Christ. The cost of peace with God is the death of Christ. The Father's character was to sacrifice his Son so that his people could be reconciled to the Father and experience peace. The triune God took action. God brought us near through the accomplishment of Jesus, and we were the offenders, not God. And now the call to God's people, those whose identity is in his bearing, or is rather in our bearing, his character as members of his family, with the full rights of their risen older brother Jesus, We now proactively seek reconciliation. We have peace with God, which fuels our ability to kill the hostility we see amongst ourselves. We now have the mission to bring those who are far off near. Near to what? To the heart of the Father. We are called to make sons. But some of the greatest evangelism the world will see is the church being reconciled to one another first. I could say so much more about that, uh, but as, as I'm preaching about peacemaking and as we think about uh, the implications of peacemaking, some of you may be asking, well, do I have to be a doormat to be a peacemaker? Well, the answer is no. Romans 12, 18 tells us that we are to live at peace uh, as far as it depends on us. And if you read further, continuing into Romans 13, uh, we see that God has instituted earthly governments to execute temporary justice. This means we should pursue temporary justice through earthly systems, but without hostility or bitterness. Peacemaking and justice are not incompatible. We pursue justice for the sake of peace, not as an overflow of hostility and bitterness. While we seek justice for the oppressed, we are called to remember the costly grace we have been shown in Jesus Christ. Because Christ has served as advocate and made peace for his people, his people then work for peace first with each other in the church and then as agents of peacemaking in each sphere of life. God's children should be known as advocates Christ's disciples work for the good of the oppressed while praying for the oppressors. Christ advocates for his people before God the Father and gives his people peace. If you call yourself a Christian, then Jesus calls you to do the same. We must make peace because we are sons of God. I wonder if there's a person in your life whom you need to seek peace with. Maybe you were the oppressor. Maybe you were the victim. God's people must grow in advocating for the oppressed in our midst. This is part of why we need each other. I need you to help me learn where I am oppressing. And we all need to learn how to advocate and grow. Christians must make peace from our identity as God's sons, who will bear the Father's image from the riches of his grace. As you're listening to this, if if this feels like too much weight for you to bear, then that's good. We can't bear this. We are naturally incapable of such righteousness. We must look to Christ's perfect strength. We must be poor in spirit. We, We must mourn our sin and depend on God's mercy shown to us in Jesus. Only then can we be agents of lasting restoration on this earth. If you are listening to this sermon and you would not consider yourself a Christian, 
I hope you leave with this thought. It is your sin that keeps you far away from God. But God will welcome you as a son wherever you are if you confess that you have sinned, repent of your sin, and believe in Jesus to be your peacemaker to God. All who have faith in Christ Jesus will one day gain the full inheritance when we see our Father face to face, full of grace and peace. Let's pray. O come, O come, King of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid all our sad divisions cease and be yourself our King of peace. Father, through your Holy Spirit, work your peace in your people's hearts. May we delight together in knowing that now, as your children, you are always with us, and everything you have is now ours. From the fullness of your grace, shape us into peacemakers who bring the far off near, as Jesus has brought us near for the glory of your name. Amen. If you are gathering in a home with another household, and together identify as sons of God, then we encourage you to receive communion together at this time, proclaiming this is the body and blood of Jesus, broken and shed for you. May we be reminded of our unity that we share as members of Christ's body.
Thank you so much for joining us today for our digital service. Uh, if you're new and have any questions, or if you've been a member here a long time and you'd love to interact with what we were saying today, we'd love to have you join us on our Zoom call. There's a link below. Join us in our lobby. We'd, there will be other pastors there. We'd love to get to know you. Also, if you are interested in a home gathering, there's another link that you should see below. Uh, we have members gathering in homes in a socially distanced, safe setting. Uh, we'd, we'd love to have our people come together. And again, if you're new, we'd, we'd encourage you to meet members in person. Uh, we'd love to learn more about you. Finally, uh, we are going to read a prayer together that you should see right on the screen. Pray with me. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.
Amen, friends. Well, thank you for joining your voices with us. As we consider now being sent from this place, let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from all blessings flow. we scatter on mission, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless us and keep us and make his face to shine upon us, that we might be agents of restoration in this city and to the ends of the earth, mm. to see all things new in Christ. Amen. It is well. it is well.